The uh, Subcommittee on Communications and Technology will come to order. The Subcommittee, uh, at the conclusion of the opening statements yesterday, the Chair called up the committee print and the bill was open for amendment at any point. The Chair now recognizes himself to offer the SU Walden Amendment labeled CBO underscore 304 and the Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to discussion draft offered by Mr. Walden and Ms. Eshoo. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with and I'll recognize myself for five minutes in support of the amendment. Good morning, everyone. At this time, we resume the markup of the discussion draft to reauthorize the law that ensures that 1.5 million subscribers in hard to reach areas continue to receive broadcast content via their chosen satellite provider. Keep in mind, satellite TV providers have more than 34 million customers nationwide. So this truly is prime time legislation and we are ready to move forward. This draft legislation represents more than a year of work, discussions, hearings and negotiations, both among affected industries and among ourselves on both sides of the aisle and within our respective parties. It proposes reasonable reforms that can become law to the current state of the video market, sensible, modern day, deregulatory changes that are supported by the major competitors in the marketplace, broadcasters, major cable operators and satellite operators. And as you know, getting all three of these on the same page is no easy task, something I know my colleagues understand. Any major changes put at risk our ability to move forward in a positive way to reauthorize this important service. My Democratic colleagues have expressed some concerns and we have worked to find common ground that would allow us to support a bipartisan bill within the framework of the narrow reforms that we have laid out. We still have some work to do, but we're encouraged by the compromises that we've reached so far. In particular, we are able to agree on revisions to the integration ban provisions in Section 6 of the draft. Mr. Latta and Mr. Green's bipartisan legislation on this issue was the inspiration for the language in the draft and the compromise achieves the same goal, the repeal of cable card integration ban and yet addresses the concerns raised by some of our colleagues across the aisle. This amendment will also place Section 4 in brackets. I understand, uh, well, I stand behind the language instructing the Federal Communications Commission to do its job and complete the quadrennial review of the media ownership rules before tinkering with JSAs, particularly because I believe that these JSAs provide benefits to rural television viewers. Placing this language in brackets, however, is a show of good faith to our Democratic colleagues that we intend to work to see if we can reach agreement on that section. Our staffs will continue to work toward bipartisan agreement in anticipation of markup by the full committee. So I want to thank uh, the ranking members, both Mr. Waxman and Ms. Eshoo, for their willingness to work with us to advance this bill. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. And I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the commitment that, uh, that you just made during uh, uh, your statement today and your opening statement uh, yesterday to work with us uh, to resolve our remaining differences before heading uh, to full committee markup. Uh, and I think that it's important that, um, uh, that the product that we send to, uh, to the full committee really have the imprimatur of this subcommittee. This is the subcommittee that really knows these issues the best. And there are an awful lot of complexities to them. Um, it's, uh, and there's uh, uh, an enormous amount of talent and understanding here. So uh, I think that uh, um, I appreciate the commitment. I think that we can do that. And I think this uh, bipartisan am amendment that we're offering uh, uh, together uh, uh, makes two uh, good changes. First, the, uh, as you said, the amendment brackets uh, Section 4, uh, which effectively bars the FCC from modifying its rules to close a, a loophole uh, that broadcasters have been exploiting to circumvent the FCC's media ownership rules. Uh, again, I'm committed to working uh, uh, with my Republican um, uh, colleagues to ensure that the FCC in, uh, completes its long overdue 2010 uh, quadrennial review. It's their responsibility to do this, to do the job. Uh, they need to get it done. Uh, I think that this chairman is committed to doing that, and unfortunately, the former chairman didn't. And uh, 
but we are four square for uh, that being uh, accomplished, as well as the 2014 review uh, based on the timetable uh, required by law. So I'm hopeful that we'll resolve our differences and ensure the FCC can continue to uphold the core values of competition, localism, and diversity. Uh, with respect to Section 6, our amendment keeps the door open on a successor to the cable card, uh, which I have pushed for, as you know. <laughs> uh, uh, and I said uh, uh, just very recently uh, during one of our hearings or whatever it was, or maybe it was our telephone conversation, that um, uh, to deconstruct what we have now and not put something in place for a successor technology, uh, I just don't think is the right way to go. I don't think it's smart. Um, and uh, while this by no means, um, I shouldn't see, say by no means. It, it, it's not my preferred approach, uh, but mom said that I'd never get 100% and she was right. It's a compromise. Uh, with an eye to the future, I think that we can ensure uh, consumer electronics manufacturers can continue to offer consumers innovative retail alternatives to the set-top boxes leased by cable operators. And I appreciate your willingness, Mr. Chairman, uh, to work with me to promote a competitive, that's the operative word, competitive set-top box marketplace. So while this amendment uh, doesn't address Section 3, the Chairman has given me and others his assurances that we'll continue working together um, uh, not only we work together, but also with stakeholders to address the remaining concerns. So I look forward to that, and uh, I think that we're headed on a um, on a um, on a good path. Yield back. Generally yields back. Any uh, further discussion on the amendment? Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move to strike the last word. I support the. Uh, of the uh, S.U. Walden Amendment. It represents an important agreement we've reached on cable set-top boxes, which are notoriously energy inefficient. To promote retail competition, the FCC issued a regulation in 2003 requiring cable companies to use a separate device called a cable card to decrypt their signals. The idea was that independent set-top box manufacturers like TiVo could then use the same technology. This rule was called the integration ban. It had good intentions, but the Department of Energy says that the requirement to segregate security from the other features of the set-top box creates significant inefficiencies. We've agreed to repeal the integration ban. Technology has advanced significantly in recent years. Cable companies want the flexibility to develop more energy-efficient ways to secure their signals. When they develop these new security technologies, they will still need to share them with the independent manufacturers, thereby preserving competition. At the same time, the amendment being offered today does not restrict the FCC's ability to readopt the integration ban in the future. This is important because it preserves the ability of the FCC to intervene if the cable companies act to thwart competition. In effect, we're taking a trust but verify approach. We are trusting that the cable companies will use their new freedom to innovate responsibly, but if they don't, we are preserving the FCC's authority to ensure there's competition in this important market. I want to thank Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Eshoo in for working tirelessly together to find common grounds, and I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Yield back my time. Thank the gentleman for his comments, and uh, well, he goes back the yield. balance of his time. Chair now recognizes the the big chairman, yeah. Mr. Upton, yeah. for five minutes. Strike the last word. I, I just want to say I commend you and Ms. Eshoo, Mr. Waxman, uh, members on, on both sides of the aisle. You know, as, as folks look at this issue, uh, failure to act is, means a million and a half subscribers will lose their signal. That's not what we intend to do. We're trying to work in a bipartisan way uh, to try and get this done. It's very important. And this overall issue is one that, quite frankly, is almost trying to balance three basketballs uh, together. It's very difficult, and I think that we've done the job between cable, satellite, and broadcasters. Now, we've done it. No one is entirely happy, that is for sure, 
But at the end of the day, we have to think about the million and a half folks that will lose their signal if we fail to act. And uh, it's been a tough slog the last uh, couple weeks. I commend those that have been in the, in the pit uh, working to get this thing done. Uh, I think this is a good product. Uh, I think that this uh, manager's amendment is, is a good one. And I appreciate the bipartisanship, the hard work uh, by the staff, I should say, as well, to try and get the issues on the table. I look forward to supporting this uh, when we conclude the markup and subcommittee this afternoon or this morning, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Any others seeking comment on the amendment? Without object, yes. Strike uh, the last word. Yeah. Uh, gentleman thank you. from Vermont. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of things. Number one, uh, congratulations on uh, reaching this bipartisan agreement. Uh, appreciate your good work and uh, working with uh, uh, Ranking Member Eshoo. Uh, secondly, uh, this reflects. Uh, some of the good things that are happening uh, in the industry. Broadcasters are uh, producing incredible uh, service. Uh, uh, the content providers are, by many uh, critics and by many viewers, seeing this as the heyday of, the, of, of, of content. Uh, viewers are really appreciating what they see. Uh, so there's good service. Uh, there's good distribution through our cable and satellite company, uh, companies. Uh, and those are the three things that uh, our chairman uh, just mentioned. But the frustration for me, frankly, is that there's one group that's being left out of our attention, and that's the consumer. Uh, the prices that they're paying are brutal. They really are. And you know, a lot of us will make statements that are heartfelt about how tough it is for everyday folks uh, to pay their bills by the end of the month. And I think all of us know how important cable, satellite uh, programming is to the people that we represent. And for some, it's sports. For some, it's the drama. For some, it's the uh, other pr programming that they can get. But the prices that they have been paying have been marching up steadily. And it's not as though I'm suggesting that we can solve that issue in this bill. But I do believe that we together have to begin addressing the consumer concerns uh, that I think are just going to get more and more significant. You know, the, the price. Um, has been going up a lot, as you all know. Uh, over the past 20 years, cable prices have increased at more than twice the rate of inflation, about 6% a year, uh, from, uh, from 2007 to 2011, which is the height of the recession, you know, when all of our folks were on pins and needles about whether they were going to keep their job, and a lot of the people we represent lost their jobs. Uh, the, the distributors increased the price of expanded basic cable service by 22%. And, you know, that's, that's telling because at a time when people are hanging on by their fingernails, when they're having to uh, basically make really hard decisions about their family budget, uh, the pricing power uh, for this industry was such that even in very, very tough times, when the number of people subscribing was flat or declining, they were able to increase those prices by 22%. So I, my view, that should be a concern to all of us. Uh, you know, you have to have a, a model of financing where our broadcasters are going to uh, get the revenue that's required to produce good programming. And we've got to have cable and satellite financial structure that's going to allow them to get that signal out uh, to the people that uh, need it and want it, that we represent. But there's got to be some inquiry, I think, into the business model that includes taking a look at how our consumers basically have no choice. They've got to buy whatever's offered to them, by and large. There's very limited choice. Uh, there's very limited pressure on some of the sports programming and the, pa uh, the prices that get passed along. So all of us, Mr. Chairman, uh, obviously have a concern about the strength of the industry, all of the elements of it, and you've done a good job here uh, putting together something that's going to maintain that. But my hope is that we're going to get serious about trying to take a look at some of these things that are driving the price up for the consumer that, in my view, basically has no ability to control that cost and has to do it on a take it or leave it basis. I yield back. Thank the gentleman for his comments and certainly as part of our COMAX update, uh, these issues will all be on the table and uh, uh, the one thing with the broadcast programming, you can put up an antenna and get a pretty good HD signal in about 35 stations, so depending about where you are. So the market, but this will certainly be an issue. Uh, it's on the minds of our consumers, our voters, and. Uh, and us, so yeah, we will be addressing you. it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other comments on the amendment? Anyone else seeking recognition? 
If not, uh, if there is no further discussion on the amendment, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there other amendments? And uh, on other amendments, our priority is to go with amendments that are bipartisan in nature first. So are there any bipartisan amendments? If not, uh, I recognize the, uh, the vice chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For recognition. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to discussion draft offered by Mrs. Blackburn of Tennessee. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm offering an amendment that would condition the ability of broadcasters to opt for retransmission consent payments on whether radio stations they own pay performers for their music. I think we could call this the keeping broadcasters consistent amendment or the what is good for the goose is good for the gander amendment. And let me just be really clear on this. I believe a broadcaster's TV signal is their property and they should have the right to negotiate for fair compensation for the carriage of that signal and its content. Broadcasters have told this committee repeatedly that retransmission consent payments are fair because cable and satellite stations make millions by retransmitting local broadcast content. Broadcasters seem to churn out a press release an hour saying anyone who uses their members' content should pay fair market value. On the other hand, when it comes to music, the same broadcasters, many who own both TV and radio stations, sing a completely different tune. They defend a system where their AM, FM stations use musicians' work and make millions off of it and they never pay a cent. This is a basic issue of modernizing the law to get rid of a dated loophole that only applies to AM, FM radio. Internet radio pays, satellite radio pays, creators for performances, cable and satellite TV radio stations, pay music creators for their performance. Everybody but AM, FM radio pays. Here's a great example. When Kenny Rogers sings The Gambler and it's played on internet radio or satellite, Kenny gets paid. But when it's played on AM, FM, he gets nothing. And NAB's radio members won't pay Kenny for his recording of The Gambler, but they come before the committee and they demand to be paid when the TV movie the TV movie of The Gambler is retransmitted. Fair pay for all creators shouldn't be a gamble. This is not the free market at work, and a free market performers could negotiate a fair price for their work on TV, Internet, or AM, FM. Instead, it's a government-sanctioned taking of a creator's property, the ultimate picking of winners and losers, and everyone who loves music gets the short end of the stick. We are the only industrialized country outside of China, Iran, and North Korea that does not pay performers for the use of their music on radio. That has real-world consequences to the American economy as we leave at least $100 million a year on the table overseas. <coughs> they don't pay our performers because we don't pay our performers. Time and again, I've asked broadcasters who've come to this subcommittee, and I know everyone gets tired of hearing about it, I've asked them to give me a, an explanation for the double standard. The problem is they never give an answer because there is not a reasonable explanation. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, generally, it yields back the balance of her time, and I forgot to read part of the script here before I recognized you, which said the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. So uh, consider that done. I, now, anyone else seeking to comment on this, uh, this amendment? Yes, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I support Ms. Blackburn's amendment, and she's been on this uh, really like white on rice for some time. Uh, she stated the case. I think it's the, the case is absolutely clear. Um, I don't think this is, I'm going to use a different set of words. I don't think this is the government playing favorites. I think that the lobbyists did a hell of a job with the Congress to get this exception in. 
uh, because I think that uh, you put this out under the sunshine, it's, uh, it's not a fair model at all. And uh, uh, while there are others that are part of broadly the uh, entertainment uh, uh, industry, um, you know, this is um, diminishing uh, what these artists produce. I mean, we value intellectual property. The framers did. They, they recognized patents in the Constitution, for heaven's sake. So uh, I, I think that this is unfair. I think that whomever created this loophole, whenever it was put into place, uh, that you can drive a Peterbilt truck through, uh, I think the gentlewoman is absolutely right. And I look forward to a time where it's going to be brought up and not withdrawn and that the, uh, that the full committee faces this and that we, uh, you know, that we bring equity across the board uh, to those that, um, uh, uh, in terms of their talents, whether, there's, whether they're writers, uh, whether they are composers, uh, whether they are the ones that are singing or playing, they're artists. They're artists, they're American artists. And I think it would be a uh, marvelous way for the entire country to say, we appreciate you. And you know what? Let's face it. Uh, you can say that to anyone, but unless you're paid, you're not appreciated. I was a volunteer for many years, so I know that. So uh, uh, to Ms. Blackburn, thank you for bringing this up over and over again. And I look forward to uh, uh, the day when um, uh, the amendment will not have to be withdrawn and uh, the full committee act on it. With that, I, uh, I don't know if I have any time left. I do. Anyone want to take the remainder of time? No? Will the gentlelady yield over? Be glad to. Uh, just to, to pose the, the contrary um, debate. I'm going to take the time back. You may. No, I'm teasing you. Then I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing, uh, I mean, John. Technology has changed a lot. And, and when radio started, they provided a great service to the songwriters by airing their music free of charge. And many stars were born because of local radio. Um, and that's true. Now there's technology. Now you've got a lot of these local stations now over the internet. Uh, and maybe there's a need to be a debate about how the world has transformed. But no one can sit here and tell me that local small town radio did not launch the careers of a lot of very successful musicians. And that historical aspect has to be part of this are part of this debate. So um, I was in a lot of small town. I represent 33 counties. I have some of the poorest communities in Illinois. And they still have local radio. And they serve their uh, customers. And when you go into these studios, they're not palatial. They're operated by one or two people. They're doing the high school basketball games. They're doing the emergency broadcast. Uh, and so I think some appreciation for local small town broadcasters are important here in this debate. And I want to thank my colleague, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady yields back. Does the gentlelady wish to withdraw her amendment at this moment? Mr. Chairman, I will withdraw the amendment and look forward to addressing this and finding a resolution to it at some point in the near future. Thank the gentlelady. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Are there uh, other members seeking to offer amendments? The gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Luan. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Which number is the gentleman's amendment? 121. Amendment to discussion draft offered by Mr. Ben, Le ben Ray Luhan of New Mexico. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, across the nation, television viewers have been divided into designated market areas, or DMAs, by the Nielsen Company. These lines reflect what Nielsen believes make up a local television market, but they don't always reflect obvious borders like state boundaries. The problem exists across the country, and in my district, a number of counties in eastern New Mexico have been drawn into the Amarillo, Texas media market, making it impossible for them to receive local broadcasts for New Mexico news, politics, sports, or culture. For many years, members of Congress from both parties have worked to bring so-called orphan counties back into their home state's television market with a piecemeal legislation. Um, even the current president of the National Association of Broadcasters, former Senator Gordon Smith, worked to provide a legislative fix so that his constituents in Oregon could watch in-state programming. 
My amendment would work to fix this problem by allowing counties adjacent to an in-state media market to import television signals from the home state. And, Mr. Chairman, I believe it is time that we seek a solution to this problem. I know that there has been lots of discussion and uh, many rural members um, on the committee uh, share some of the concerns with what is happening back in their respective districts. And this is something, Mr. Chairman, that as uh, we have this conversation continue, whether it is today or um, towards final markup, that I hope that we can work together on to uh, address some of these issues across the country. Gentlemen, yield. Yes, I, I appreciate the gentleman's comments, and uh, obviously, a lot of us face these similar issues, um, which is why it makes for a great topic moving forward with our Comms Act update. Is the appropriate place for this, I believe, because it is pretty intricate when you get into it, uh, in terms of how markets are defined, as you well know, uh, based on the Nielsen uh, market divisions. Um, and actually, I have issues in my district that are affected as well. Uh, or viewers that are affected uh, in several locations. And so it is one I know a number of members on the committee are concerned about, but I think it, it needs to be dealt with in the con broader context of the uh, Com Act update when we look at all of these issues. And, Mr. Chairman, uh, reclaiming my time, with that being said, I, I still think that maybe there is an opportunity to, um, if we could work with the majority as well as with our ranking member um, leading up to markup, if maybe we can have some conversations um, whether it is the tool with uh, an update to the Telecom Act or as we approach uh, what would be a final markup um, in the full committee um, on Stella as well, um, if that would be something that we might be able to do. And if there is agreement there, then um, I would um, uh, be willing to withdraw the amendment today. Well, I am happy to have discussions with you on this or any other issues, uh, the, see where it might lead. Would the gentleman yield? I would. Um, uh, I, I want to thank Mr. Lujan for uh, uh, not only the time and effort he's, he's put into this, but his, um, it really his passionate advocacy on this issue. And he takes something that is complex and really rather dry and sounds so uninteresting on the surface, and he puts a human face on it, because there are so many people that he represents that are really being screwed by this in plain English. And uh, there are 18 members of the full Energy and Commerce Committee that represent rural areas in our country. And I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the first thing I'd recommend is that they all come together first. See what you can come up with and bring it to the leadership of the committee. But 18 members representing rural areas, you have commonality on something. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of votes. So uh, I salute you for what you've been doing. Uh, I support you, uh, uh, but uh, I, I just throw in a little recommendation here uh, that uh, you, have a, you, you have a lot of power going for you in terms of the number of members on this committee, and I would say use it. And with that, thank you for yielding to me. And, Mr. Chairman, with that, I would withdraw the amendment. Gentleman withdraws his amendment. Are there other amendments? Uh, without objection, withdraws the amendment. Are there other amendments that uh, members have to offer on, uh, I'll alternate back and forth if we can. Uh, Mr. Scalise is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate the, uh, the time for the markup and wanted to present an amendment uh, that really addresses. Before you speak to the amendment, can we have the, can you offer it and then the clerk? And then be we'll happy to offer the amendment up. Amendment to discussion draft offered by Mr. Scalise of Louisiana. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. Now I would recognize the gentleman from Louisiana for five minutes to talk about his amendment. Great. Yeah, this amendment is, is directed towards giving consumers more choice. And I think as we uh, go through this conversation about our outdated uh, com uh, communications law, and there's talk of, of having a broader conversation on communications law, the Stella Bill uh, is addressing some of these. In fact, uh, with Sweeps Week, there's uh, and there's always been historically uh, some other provisions included in a Stella law, and I know as, as myself, uh, Ms. Eshu, and others have talked about the, uh, the broader conversation that we need to have. This amendment deals specifically uh, with three components that are in the law right now that, that really uh, are part of that outdated system of laws that, that deny consumers choice. In fact, uh, one of the provisions in Stella that's been in there for some time now is a good faith negotiation requirement. The government actually has to require uh, that both parties, the, uh, the broadcasters and the, 
video producers, uh, the, the content providers, have to negotiate in good faith. Now, you would say if there was a free market, you would not need a requirement uh, that there's a good faith negotiation. But in fact, uh, because we don't have a free market, I think it underscores the fact that we don't currently have a free market because there are all these mandates uh, that are put in law uh, that impede that free market negotiation. Uh, Congress, over time, has put in place a law that requires the two parties to negotiate in good faith. So the first part of the amendment actually removes the expiration, says, okay, if, if we're going to have this requirement of good faith, let, let's not have an expiration on it. Let's, let's have that go forward in time. But then ultimately, let's get to a free market so that you don't have to mandate good faith. There would be, uh, there would be uh, in, in just in, in essence, forced good faith negotiations because there would be a free market where the parties would have to decide that. That gets to the next two parts of this amendment. Uh, one uh, would remove uh, the basic service tier mandate that, that dictates by the federal government which stations have to be on the basic tier. Uh, again, this is part of what should be a free market negotiation. The basic tier is the most valuable piece of real estate uh, when you're talking about what cable providers, uh, what fiber providers, uh, negotiate when they're putting together packages. And right now under current law, if, if, if a station opts to go through the retransmission consent component of the law, then they're guaranteed a place on the basic service tier that, uh, that a uh, video provider would offer to their consumers. And, and look, ultimately, whatever that basic tier is, that should be a negotiation again between two parties. Uh, it shouldn't be a mandate by the federal government that tells you what has to be on that basic piece of real estate that's so valuable. And so let the two parties negotiate uh, what that basic tier would look like. Don't have the federal government telling uh, people what it, sh what it should be. And the th final provision of this amendment uh, would repeal uh, the buy-through mandate. Again, uh, right now the federal government, through a lot of these heavy-handed laws, is dictating uh, the terms of a negotiation so that the consumers don't have that choice. The federal government's taking that choice away from consumers. If a consumer in my district or your district or anyone else's wants to just go buy a sports package. You know, maybe they don't want to have to buy a product that they can actually get for free uh, using a, a $10 rabbit ear. If they say, I want to get the product that I, I get for free without buying the product that I could get for free, I just want to go buy a sports package. They can't do that right now. The federal government, the federal government actually mandates uh, that they first have to buy the basic service tier and then go and buy the sports package if that's uh, the choice that they want to make. So they don't really get the ability just to buy what they want they have to first go through the basic service tier. That's a federal mandate. Let that be a negotiation, not only between the two parties uh, that are negotiating uh, how the video content's gonna be provided, but also let that be a consumer choice. Uh, I know my, my friend from Vermont, Mr. Welch, talked about consumer choice. Uh, this this is, gets to the heart of what impedes the ability for, for consumers in our districts to have the true freedom of choice that they want, uh, and, and ultimately at the price they want. Again, let them have that choice. If they choose, they want to buy all of those different options. Many do, and many still would. Uh, but again, should that really be a federal mandate that's in statute as it is right now uh, that takes that choice away from consumers and forces it upon, uh, not only through government forces it on consumers, but forces it on those providers as well. So again, just some basic uh, common sense reforms that remove some of these mandates uh, that in some cases actually drive up the cost and take ch choices away from consumers. Uh, that's what this amendment does that I'm offering up, Mr. Chairman, and that you'll bet. I thank the gentleman for his comments, and uh, I certainly recognize the considerable effort that he's put into bringing pro-competition, pro-consumer principles uh, into this debate, uh, and agree the law, uh, that the laws require updating, which is, of course, why we're moving into the Comact update effort. And to quote uh, our friend from Illinois, telecom uh, reform is not for sissies. Um, and so we look forward to, uh, to having these discussions and more with all committee members as part of this, uh, as part of this debate. Uh, is there any other comment on this amendment? If not, does the gentleman wish to withdraw his amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I know you've talked about this. I've, I know we've had conversations as well. We will get into a broader uh, Communications Act uh, review and, and ultimately legislation uh, dealing with these broader issues. This, uh, these ought to be part of that broader mm -hmm. discussion. And ultimately, uh, these are going to be tough decisions that we have to grapple with. Right. But again, you've got a law that dates back to 1992. It's incredibly outdated. Technology has advanced mm -hmm. so far beyond where the law is. And, and, and that's what our committee's tasked with, is dealing with these tough issues. And these are part of that. And mm -hmm. I appreciate the conversation we've started 
uh, over these last few months, but ultimately will continue with the broader. We actually have update. a lot that dates back to 1934 or 1927. Or right. We're finally trying to get rid of the telegraph requirement. I, that the, I the FCC has to provide a, a report on competition in the telegraph industry, and I appreciate your your work with me on getting I know that you've uh, waited addressed. For that report. It'd be nice, yeah. nice if we get the Senate to address it as well. But with that, I uh, look forward to this broader debate and ultimately resolution of these outdated problems and uh, withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Gentleman withdraws his amendment. Chair recognizes General Lady from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to salute Mr. Scalise for his uh, um, passion on the issue that he just uh, offered in the form of an amendment. And uh, uh, you know that we've worked together on this, uh, on the broader issues relative to, uh, uh, to retrans. And um, uh, thank you. For, uh, you know what you've contributed to it uh, I'm sorry that we don't have um, uh, a solution in this effort uh, but I can't let this go by without saying something about it because I think it's so important uh, last December I introduced uh, as you know mr. chairman the video choice act uh, as a way oh yes I have it at the desk I do generally uh, has an amendment trap, at the desk clerk else. will report the amendment Amendment to discussion draft offered by Ms. Eshoo of Without California. Without objection, the reading thank of the amendment suspense with now the gentlelady thank uh, may Thank you, proceed. thank you, thank uh, you. Uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, the Video Choice Act uh, 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 represents a way to eliminate broadcast uh, television uh, blackouts and give consumers greater flexibility to choose the channels they receive each month from their cable, satellite, or other pay TV provider. Sounds fair, doesn't it? Um, but it gets uh, into a real hairball. Um, in my view, these uh, retransmission consent fees are an unsustainable business model. I think you know you have something fair if you not only go to sell it to someone, but if you're willing to buy it back. If you're willing to buy it back. And I think if you want to look for a racket or a gun held to the head of businesses in this country, just take a look at this one. That's why I say I think it's an unsustainable business model. I'm not against anybody making money, but this, is, this goes way over the top. This goes way over the top. Uh, uh, the, and we're, we're going to ignore it. It's going to be put off for two years, four years, five years, seven years, I don't know. Uh, there are a growing number of blackouts, 127 of them in 2013. I don't think that's a small number. And uh, the fees which are expected to more than double, more than double, from $3.3 billion last year to $7 billion by 2018. Maybe we can get this done, the telecom rewrite and whatever, between, uh, before 2018, so that this $7 billion won't be... Uh, uh, extracted uh, because you know who's picking up the tab? The consumers, all of our constituents. So uh, we've got to get some starch in our spines on this thing. And uh, I know it's offensive to, to the people that are making a lot of money, uh, but it's, it really is not a sustainable business model. And they're going to keep doing this uh, until they can't do it anymore. Uh, and while there are practices that we don't like, um, uh, in the video marketplace, um, I believe that, uh, that this one really, I wished, drew the attention of the full subcommittee uh, because it, uh, uh, the blocking of the online content during a retrans dispute adds insult to injury. Late August, last August, during the Time Warner Cable CBS dispute, millions of Americans were prevented from accessing online video content that is freely available on CBS.com. And to make matters worse, the blocking of this online content didn't just impact Time Warner Cable's video customers. It affected anyone who used the company as their internet provider. I don't know who can stand up with a straight face and say, and applaud this. I mean, this is, to me, is really egregious. And it meant that subscribers of other pay TV providers like DirecTV or DISH 
uh, who had nothing to do with the retrans dispute uh, were impacted. And the public outcry uh, was, um, was strong and rightfully so. And at the time, uh, public knowledge described it as, quote, CBS crossed a line from permissible hardball tactics to unfair consumer abuse. And uh, Consumer Action said, now CBS is punishing everyone who has Time Warner as an internet provider by denying them access to the same CBS online content it offers free to the public. Uh, so this amendment instructs the FCC to examine whether the blocking of a television broadcast station's owned or affiliated online content during a retransmission consent negotiation constitutes a failure to negotiate in good faith. Um, I'm not only offering this, um, I uh, uh, have been told it's not on the map. It's not in the uh, cards uh, for us to deal with. Uh, I'm disappointed in that. I'm deeply disappointed. Uh, but as long as I'm around, I'm going to be talking about this. So uh, there aren't too many records left, but I'm going to be the broken record on it. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that, uh, uh, that the subcommittee and the FCC will uh, really very carefully review the concern, consumer harm of blocking online content. And with that, I'll... Uh, withdraw my amendment. Gentlelady withdraws Yield her back. amendment. Are there other members uh, on the Republican side seeking to offer an amendment? Or Mr. Chairman, may I speak on? Well, she withdrew I her knew, amendment. I can make a comment on it. Uh, I can strike the you last can, word. Yeah, you can strike the last That's great. word. Oh, uh, yes, go ahead. We'll, we'll do that, and then I'll come to Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank you and Ranking Member Eshoo for your hard work on this draft and working towards improving the Stella bill. It's always been a bipartisan initiative, and I'm hopeful that tr tradition continues. I, I want to speak um, about Ranking Member Eshoo's amendment. The issue of digital rights as stellar negotiations move forward is something that we must address. More and more, we're learning that digital rights are the central factor in meaningful retransmission negotiations. Emerging and innovative technologies have begun to change the retransmission discussion from traditional fights about money to fights about access and ownership of content as it migrates to the online platform. We know that American innovation is transforming our nation's video marketplace. More and more consumers are now watching TV and streaming videos over the internet. We've seen a race towards negotiating content deals before or as a part of retransmission consent deals. Last summer, the licensing of digital rights emerged as a central issue in the CBS Time Warner Cable retransmission consent dispute. A few weeks ago, we saw a groundbreaking content deal between ABC and DISH, which is the first to raise the possibility of a paid TV provider using a media company's content for a new online service without requiring customers to subscribe to the video portion of their cable and satellite subscription. As video programming migrates to the internet, we are also starting to see more disputes between content providers and broadband providers. For example, a recent video streaming deal between Comcast and Netflix illustrated how the quality of over-the-top content could be impacted. Just yesterday, reports surfaced that Com Comcast and Apple are in talks to create a streaming television service. Content has become the golden ticket. While some of the content deals may benefit consumers, some may also raise important issues of access to content for consumers. I do not think we fully understand yet the impact of these significant streaming and content deals on consumers, like internet blocking. We all know that consumers are tired of being caught in the middle of traditional retransmission disputes. This bill does not protect consumers from disputes on the content side of the negotiations. We need to ensure that all Americans have access to the appropriate content they want when they need it at adequate internet speeds. We need to be mindful of this moving forward. I look forward to working with my colleagues to ensure consumers have access to a free and open internet. And I support um, Representative Eshoo's work on this, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentlelady for her comments. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers. <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Um, I don't have an amendment, but I do have an issue that I would like to discuss. Um, I'm concerned about a situation that is affecting my part of the country um, with one of the uh, network stations, Inspiration, a popular channel offering wholesome family value content. Um, it was brought to my attention recently that DirecTV, which um, is actually, I am actually a consumer of, um, is no longer carrying um, Inspiration uh, Network. And I know that that had to do with some negotiation issues, and I'm not saying that we should uh, find ourselves in the middle of um, negotiations between, between businesses. However, I am concerned for my constituents. I, I believe this is an issue of choice. I believe this is an issue of fairness. And when I see large cable and satellite companies decide to carry some networks for free while requiring others to pay, it raises the issue. And, it, and I have to ask the question why, particularly when the survival of independent channels is at risk at this point. And this particular station has shown that um, they are in the top tier of most watched channels. Before we impose a remedy, I believe we need to look at the problem and we need to find out and get to the core of the issue. So I, I I'm asking that this committee give its commitment to request that the GAO study the independent channel treatment by pay TV platform providers so we can actually take part in a solution to this issue and be able to pr continue to provide for our constituents and families good choices when it comes to viewing. Would the gentlewoman yield? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to commend the gentlewoman for, uh, uh, for continuing to bring up this issue. Uh, it, in my view, um, uh, all the different parts of our country and communities and whatever have their own profile and character, their likes, their dislikes, their traditions, their tastes. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's about localism and, and what and the diversity of programming that they should be able to have. And I think in the smaller a community, the closer they are to that. And it's, it's very much a part of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I think the idea of a GAO report uh, is, is a good one. I, I just want to offer my uh, support in bringing perhaps the parties together, because I, I don't think anything is going to happen legislatively with this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're doing Stella, we're leaving out other things that the chairman believes are too complicated to be handled at this point and move it into a telecom 21st century. Let, I, we haven't come up with a name yet. But uh, I, I would be willing to work with you I see in uh, helping to bring the, uh, 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 bringing the parties together and, uh, and seeing if we can um, uh, get them to work with each other to resolve the issue. Uh, Reclaiming I my time, I, I thank the gentlelady for offering her support on this issue. And I, I know there are many other members of our committee who also would like to see. Will the gentlelady yield on that point? Yes. I, I think uh, my, my colleagues' comments are, are meritorious in that uh, a GAO study would serve us well. More information is better than less information. So I would, uh, I would hope that you would receive a request and we could do that as a as a committee and with that I thank my colleague for bringing it up and yield back to her. If the gentlelady would yield. Yes. I want to thank her for raising the issue and I think it's an important part of the discussion whether we do it with Stella or we do it with the Telecom Act looking at the evolution of and the growth of the telecommunications industry and how it affects content production and distribution, and looking again at the end use uh, of this in the compensation models. All of these are issues that uh, require our committee's time. I agree with the comments that hopefully uh, this will get individuals to negotiate. There is very little legislatively mm -hmm. that we can do, but the awareness that it is an evolving marketplace and the regulations that are in place by the federal government do not keep pace with the technology and the delivery systems that are available to the American public today. And I yield back to the gentlelady. 
Thank you to, to the gentlelady for her comments as well. And if there are no other comments, I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentlelady's thank you. time's expired. We thank the gentlelady for raising this issue. It's an important one that we hope the uh, parties can reach agreement on in the uh, marketplace that will be beneficial to the consumers. And so uh, uh, recognize the chairman. The, yes, for what purpose does the gentleman strike the last word? He's recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'm just going to use about 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to say that I fully support the uh, reauthorization of Stella, and I'm encouraged that we're moving the process forward, and particularly that as we move forward, uh, it seems to be more and more bipartisan. As the, the gentlewoman from Tennessee mentioned, growth in the telecommunications sector, um, and I would just say in general, you know, obviously it's a huge engine for growth, but experience has has taught us in this committee that when we move in a bipartisan way, that's when we're the most successful in actually accomplishing uh, uh, great things. So I just want to commend you and Ms. Eshu as we move forward that this uh, continue to be uh, bipartisan. And I support your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen from New Jersey. I'd give him even another 30 seconds if he wanted to continue down that line. But uh, now I'd, any, uh, I'd recognize the gentleman from New, New Mexico. For what purpose does he seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. 122. Amendment to discussion draft offered by Mr. Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico. Without objection, the reading of the amendment suspends with. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, the FCC delegates the role of drawing DMAs to the Nielsen Company, a private for-profit marketing research company. Nielsen, which claims to have never sought this power, has carved up the country into DMAs based upon what it perceives to be the most watched broadcasting market in each area. Of course, our current law only allows for a single television market to broadcast in a given area. So it appears Nielsen misinterprets the local broadcaster monopoly as the preference of the DMA's audience when really no such choice actually exists. Instead, while only about 10 percent of television viewers continue to receive their television signal over the air, Nielsen's maps provide each broadcasting market with all the territory touched by their antiquated system of broadcast antennas. My amendment would push the FCC to embrace the future of broadcasting and explore the possibilities of cutting-edge technologies where we've even heard from the broadcasters that they're exploring. With the broadband connection, viewers can watch an almost infinite amount of on-demand video online with a smartphone, tablet, or other mobile device. And from what we understand, there will be more broadcasters that will be moving to streaming their content online as well, so they can watch this content from Wi-Fi hotspots or virtually anywhere with the wireless service. Through the internet, consumers can listen to radio signals from around the globe. Um, in the office, we often enjoy New Mexico radio stations um, uh, as well. But Nielsen's maps uh, from the 1950s keeps programming from outside the DMA blocked out to viewers. Um, I would ask, Mr. Chairman, that we explore modern approaches to uh, look at these markets that are based upon current technologies and new technologies instead of yesterday's. Uh, my amendment builds upon a study of DMAs commissioned by the last Stella bill in 2010 to require the FCC to update its earlier efforts and to explore how updated modern uh, markets could be recognized if they are based upon current technology capabilities instead of antenna limitations. And Mr. Chairman, we know that this is a, a complex issue, but nonetheless, as we have had hearings, um, I have certainly appreciated hearing from all sides here, um, whether it is cable companies, uh, uh, the, the satellite companies, the broadcasters, content providers as they are engaging new technologies to be able to get content out. And as we um, have that conversation, Mr. Chairman, I hope that this may be an area as well that we might be able to work together um, to include this conversation in, in any um, uh, hearings that we may be having or in any rewrites of, of, of any legislation. And with that, I, I yield to the Chairman. I, I appreciate that, and uh, it, it's certainly a discussion we need to have, and the GAO can provide us some uh, excellent guidance. Uh, so as we work moving forward, uh, we may be able to figure out something there. And with that, Mr. Chairman, look forward to working with you and with the mm -hmm. ranking member and committee staff yeah. on this as well, and uh, with GAO and others. And so with that, I would withdraw the amendment. The gentleman withdraws his amendment. Any further comments? If not, the question now occurs on favorably reporting to the full committee, the committee print, 
as amended to amend the Communications Act of 1934 to extend expiring provisions relating to the retransmission of signals of television broadcast stations and for other purposes as amended. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the committee print is favorably reported. Without objection, staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the committee print approved by the subcommittee today, so ordered. And without objection, the subcommittee now stands adjourned. And I thank the members for their cooperation and work on this legislation.